What's the word, y'all? What are your most unpopular NBA opinions? Feel free to leave them in the comment section, but this was a question that was asked on Reddit, and this comes up once every, like, what, two months over on Reddit, but I'm always intrigued to dive into it because I just want to see what other people are thinking because sometimes I see someone's unpopular opinion, I'm like, man, they kind of right on that. A lot of the times I see someone say unpopular opinion, but, and the thing that they say is not even an unpopular opinion, is damn near the consensus. I don't want to see that today. I hope we don't see that today. But we're going to go through this, this Reddit thread and uh, just react to some of the unpopular opinions that other NBA fans have. Leave a like, subscribe. I want to say shout out to uh, Raul Raja for starting it off. They give us 10 of their own. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't want to spend the entire video on your own. So I'm going to go through the first one. The NBA's draft age should be raised. Oh my God, he's already starting off. That is a legitimate unpopular opinion. Players will come in more developed. Okay. Mm. I think I guess, we're gonna make an argument. We're gonna make an argument against these. Rebuilds will be shorter and there will be more scouting opportunities. Yeah, I'm completely against this. I'm assuming that the, the next level to be raising the age has to be 21. Because right now, what would be 19 or one year removed from what would have been your college season? I don't know what the hell the rules are. I am very pro. If, if someone wants to give you a job at a high school of millions and millions of dollars and you want to say yes, then you should have that opportunity. So I'm saying I would like to see straight out of high school and basketball again. Understand that that somewhat hurts the product. And I, I think that's what this guy's alluding to when we go into getting players that are one year removed from college or even in my example, going straight out of high school. The product is going to suffer because everybody's shooting for the fences. Oh, we want to get that 19 year, year old because by the time he is 23, he might be one of the best players in basketball and we see a lot of bust. We see a lot of people not hit that full potential because everybody's drafted for potential instead of just gra drafting the best player available. But like, dog, if we raise it up to 21, that means we wouldn't have got like the first couple seasons of John Morant. The hype that was Zion Williamson. Paolo Bancaro averages like 20 something points per game. He's 19. We would have we told, bro, stay over there. Stay over there in Duke for two more seasons. I think that does more hurt than, than greatness for, for the league and for these young people growing up. Because as y'all know, in the game of sports, something can end just like that. Can you imagine the dude that would be good enough to come out at 19 years old, but they had to stay for two more seasons, and boom, a ruptured Achilles happens? Like, that that's raps. You're done. So I, I really don't like this. I mean, you can make the argument like he does that people will be more developed, but I would argue that there's nothing better than NBA development. That plan in college is not getting you ready for the NBA exactly because the styles are stylistically different stylistically different that's why we see so many players dominating college and then scouts like eh, tyler hands bro he might be the greatest college player of our, our generation we're not drafting him in the top 10 or something like that man that was extreme exaggeration no disrespect tyler hands bro but yeah I, I was exaggerating but you get what i'm saying that guy was elite like he's what 13th all time in points scored in college basketball history or something like that couldn't run in the nba he talked about the Bulls. Yeah, they're not going to win the playoff series with this core. We know that that's not an unpopular opinion. The Timberwolves are making a mistake trying to build around Carthony Towns. It's an interesting one. And maybe what I'm about to say right now is an unpopular opinion. You let me know if I'm bugging or not. I don't think you should build around anybody that's not top 10 or damn near it. Because that's how you pigeonhole yourself to a roster that might be good enough to make the playoffs and win a couple playoff series. But that's that's it. You know, I, I, if I am a GM, I'm not building around a particular player unless that dude is really, really that goddamn, that goddamn good. And instead of rebuilding around Carlton Towns in this, in this situation that we're talking about, I'm just going to accumulate pieces that I think are good. We're not going to say that, hey, Cat is our one and everything we do after this is because we want to, we want to put Cat in the best position. I think you got to be top 10 for that if I'm a general manager. But this this offseason, they did exactly that. They, they built around Carlton Towns. They knew Carlton Towns had a, a ceiling as your starting center when it comes to the defensive side of the ball. So let's go get the best defensive center when it comes to rim deterrence and rim protection in the last 10 years. And they started off struggling through the first 20 or so games. And look, somebody said, I feel like this one is a pretty, pretty popular opinion. Talking about the Carlton Towns one. So, okay. The Bulls should sell their parts and start over Zach Levine. Is it a franchise player? It goes back to what I just said a couple seconds ago. Um, Yeah, I mean, if you aren't a franchise player, I'm not building around you. I wouldn't even say that the Bulls try to build around Zach Levine. Because I don't know if a lot of the pieces on the roster are complimentary to what Zach Levine does I mean you can't say hey we building around Zach Levine but in the last five minutes of the game he not gonna touch the ball because DeMar DeRozan is really that nice you know what I'm saying I don't think they built around Zach Levine I think they built 
a team to make the playoffs that just so happens to have Zach Levine as one of the best pieces. You know what I'm saying? Because fit-wise, let's be real. If you're building around Zach Levine, you're not going to get DeMar DeRozan and Nikola Vucevic because those aren't plus defenders, and Zach Levine has never been a plus defender. You know what I'm saying? So, that I, I mean, as a lot of Bulls fandom, selling their parts is a place that they kind of want to be in, especially if Patrick Williams this morning is talking about, hey, I'm starting to feel like I could be a superstar. It's going to be hard for him to develop into a superstar if Zach Levine and DeMar DeRozan are there taking all the shots. I don't I don't have an opinion either way. It's so hard to say when it is my team. <laughs> it's, I would tell every other organization, oh, you need to blow it up. Oh, you need to buy. But when it is my team and I am like emotionally like like attached to this organization, I can't say that hey, we should hit the reset or, or we should be by. I don't know. Last week, I was so down after Jayla Suggs gamed us. And then we won two back-to-back -back games against the Celtics and the Bucks. And then we came back and lost to the OKC Thunder. I don't know what my emotions should be with this Bulls team. This one right here is interesting. People keep telling me Evan Mobley is the next great big guy. That he has first-team All-NBA potential. And then I watch him play and barely notice him out there. I'm not saying he's a bad player, but I'm personally not seeing this potential next level star and i can i guess understand where this person is coming from but i disagree completely i do believe that evan mobley has the potential to be that good and examples like tonight is why that why i say that when they're missing jared allen so now it's a it's a little bit easier for evan mobley to do the things that we see that evan mobley can do let me see if i can find a couple possessions from the game that i watched today against the detroit pistons Obviously, I can't play you too many of these clips, but this is just a small sample size of the versatility that we as Evan Mobley truthers see when we watch him play. This one is just a, a screen with Darius Garland. His vision on a short roll is really, really developed for somebody that's basically, what, just old enough to drink alcohol? I mean, we have bigs in the NBA right now that we all consider as really, really good bigs that don't have the vision to make that pass and he's 21 doing that or we could talk about the soft touch around the rim and he knows when to do like this little little one hander and when to try to dunk on you and then sometimes bro completely gets into his bag this is a workout session high off the glass move and if i can have you listen to the commentary um the detroit Pistons commentator said well that was impressive and it was, you know, so I am a, a truth of Evan Mobley, obviously the defensive side of the ball. I don't need to show you highlights of that because you should know that Evan Mobley is really, really good of a defender as a big. Um, but, you know, him playing alongside Jared Allen for the first couple years of his career is kind of pigeonhole in his ability to just do what he could potentially do on the offensive end. And he's playing with Darius Garland and now Donovan Mitchell. So he'll always at the well, not always, but for the first couple years of this this team being together, he will be looked at to be like the third option at the most because Darius and Donovan are such ball dominant good guards. But you do have Darius, who is one of the better passers in basketball, who goes to the podium after games and say, hey, we e emo is great. Emo does this. Emo does this. Emo does that. And we're going to get him more involved. We want him to be more aggressive. They got good leadership. They got a good point guard. And, and I think he's going to be a stud. This person says too much scoring makes the game boring. And we all have our own personal preference when it comes to basketball. I, myself, is a guy that, that loves a good grinded out game, that loves great defense. But I still don't I still don't agree with this. I know we have an all-time high of people averaging 30 points per game in a season. The shooting efficiency is basically an all-time high. Uh, the points per game are is the highest it's been since, like, the mid-70s. So, yes, we're having a another scoring renaissance. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we could be talking selfishly. But I think the scoring aspect is great for growing the game. This next generation that, that falls in love with basketball and becomes the NBA players of 20 years from now, I can't imagine how talented and good they're going to be because you got all the footage in the world to watch John Moran do his speed through move that I keep seeing on TikTok over and over and over. Kids doing this move. The Curry renaissance or the, the three-point renaissance and the kids coming out and just shooting from half court already. I know it's bad for development, but when they hitting, they hitting. Um, so I, I don't think it makes it boring. It does lead to maybe more blowouts than we would want on, in individual games, but this season, I don't, I don't have a stats to prove this, feels closer than last season. I vividly remember last season coming onto this and being like, man, another day of blowouts. What do we even talk about? And I feel like every single night we at least got a couple very close games. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I think defenses do ramp up, obviously, once we get to the postseason, and we all know that.
LaMelo Ball is not a winning player and is not a franchise cornerstone type prospect. He's inefficient, he plays no defense, doesn't take care of the ball, and has terrible shot selection. People give him way too much credit because he's flashy, but no one sees all the terrible moments. That, I mean, I can't really say that's a super hot take because he got about 800 people that upvoted that. And you know what, there's probably people that upvoted it because it is a hot take, um, even if they don't completely agree. This is a, this is a tough one for me. Because I've, I've heard this argument before and, and I've watched a good amount of Charlotte basketball, um, especially last season with the announcers being at least comical and Miles Bridges um, when he was doing his thing. And I kind of understand where this guy's coming from, but the only reason I'm not agreeing is because LaMelo Ball's, what, 20, 21 of that? Based on what Raul wanted in the beginning of this video, he would have just been making it into the league right now. So I can't really say that I agree with this because even though we do get the bonehead shots like you mentioned or the turnovers, the Charlotte Hornets last season were the sixth best offense in basketball. Sixth. And that ain't without LaMelo Ball. I'm, I'm just I'm just saying. I don't know if he can be the best point guard in basketball, like maybe some people believe. But as far as being the engine of an adequate and to really good offense, LaMelo Ball can really do that. And we saw that last season. He's one of the best transition passers we have in basketball. One of the best transition players we have in basketball in general. Even though he don't like to get to the basket himself. He, he, I can't, I can't agree. I just can't agree. So for the end of this video, I decided to sort by controversial because those are the legitimate unpopular opinions. It's baffling how Reddit is such a consensus against this, but Tatum is uni unilaterally better than Luka. And someone said, a basketball question mark? Unpopular opinion. Jokic is the best offensive player of all time. Can't say that, but he's high on that list. He's definitely high. People worry way too much about getting out-rebounded. Now, that is an unpopular opinion because that if you can't close a possession, you didn't play good defense. So that now that's actually a wild, bad possession. Like, like, I think that's a unpopular take and a terrible take, too. Someone said, I strongly disagree with this one. In the last five years, the playoff offensive rebound percentage ranking of the championship team, fifth, second, second, 14th, and fifth. Only one team in the last five years won a championship without being a dominant offensive rebounder team when it came to the playoffs. So, boom, take that, Sebastian. I This is the last one I'm going to read because it is a novel. I think Draymond is the greatest defensive player in history. I think most of what he does isn't measured by stats. The guys we consider to be the greatest are the ones who block a lot of shots, but blocking shots is one small, small aspect of playing great defense. <sighs> the same way cornerbacks shouldn't be judged by interceptions he is complete disruptor who will read the play and break it up before beforehand forcing oh, blah, 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 blah. okay i mean i i mean if you ask me who's the greatest defensive player of all time i'm gonna shrug my shoulders because it's not extremely important for me to have a list of greatest defensive players of all time i think draymond himself claimed that he was the best defensive player of all time and at the end of the day that's all that really matters if you're the best in your heart that's all that really matters draymond and i mean that to you too watching this video it's all about what's in here. It's on this side. 